on data science with uh, Python. Just to remind all of you, the instructions is going to be same. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to post your questions on the chat window. I will keep monitoring all the questions that are coming in. I'll answer them at the appropriate time. If there are any questions that are uh, left unanswered by the end of the session, I'll make sure uh, we will have some 10 minutes uh, dedicated to answer those uh, questions. To start with today, this is going to be the agenda for day two. Um, to give a brief about uh, what we have discussed yesterday. Yesterday, we started with um, introduction to data science. We spent time to understand what is typical data science looks like. So what type of applications that we want to build uh, using data science. So data science is all about decision making. By predicting things that are about to happen into the future. So the major part of data science is the predictive analytics. And within the predictive analytics part, we mainly focused on supervised learning because that's the biggest area within the predictive analytics as a data scientist we would have to master. Within supervised learning, we have two types, the regression and then the classification. In regression, we try to predict a outcome that is typically going to be a continuous number. In classification, we are going to predict a, a target variable that is generally discrete binary we saw an example for each one of them predicting the resale price of a car and predicting the customers who are going to default their loans predicting the resale price of the car guessing the resale price of the car is nothing but a regression problem and predicting the customers who are going to default the loans they took from the bank is a classification problem a binary classification problem because our target variable here takes values like s or no zero one okay and we discussed about the approach what is our approach we will always try to learn from the historical data so we take a sample from the historical data we will try to learn from the historical sample and from that learning, we are going to make predictions into the future. And once, let's assume that we have learned and we have started making predictions. Now we want to judge how good our predictions are. So without assessing how good the predictions are, we cannot blindly trust, we cannot blindly rely on the learning that we had. So to assess that, we use some sort of uh, metrics, performance metrics. We discussed about some metrics in regression. We discussed about some metrics in classification, right? So that's, that's the basic level introduction to the data science. But to perform all these tasks, we need the help of a programming language. Many programming languages, like I mentioned yesterday, we can do this, we can perform these tasks with different programming languages. But Python is the most popular among all, and that's Sagar the reason we choose Python. Sagar, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, some participants are uh, telling that uh, voice is too low, sir. Okay. You can is see it in the chat box. Okay, uh, is it same for everyone? Please type in the chat box. Maybe, maybe. 
for some people it is audible sir maybe some people it is not uh, audible okay uh, please check your volume settings once because uh, from from the mic side i did check uh, it's it's all fine uh, maybe you try to increase your volume to the maximum extent Okay, a lot of people saying voice is good and few people saying voice is not audible. It I request be... all the participants to use uh, headphones or earphones. Yes. Then it will be audible. Okay, so most Thank of you. them are right now saying the voice is good. I will yes, maintain sir. the same pitch and the same level uh, throughout my presentation. Thank you, sir. No problem, sir. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so let's get into day two. So we need a programming language to do all of this stuff. So we start the day two with introduction to Python. So the Python is going to be our uh, go-to programming language for anything in data science. So let's start with how can we use Python? So today, I want to set uh, the basics of the usage of Python. How do we get started with Python as a programming language? That's going to be the main agenda. Um, I may not be able to cover each and every aspect of it because of the limited time that we have. I'll try to point out some of those additional readings uh, as in when we hit those steps. Um, you can make a note of them. Uh, you probably would have access to this uh, recording again, so you can listen to it again. So those are the additional things that you probably have to uh, prepare for yourself, read for yourself, okay? Now with that, let's, let's dive into our day two session. First of all, installing Python. So installing Python can be done in many different ways. For any official information on Python, you can visit this python.org. So this is the official page for Python. So every news, everything, documentation, installation files, everything you will find in this python.org now i'm not going to use this one here so if you want to really download the python plain version of python you can simply click here you can see the latest version of python is uh, 3.8 so for people who are already familiar with python you might know that a python had two major versions we call them as python 2 and Python 3. So anything that starts with 2.7 is the Python 2 version of it. Anything that starts with 3. something is the Python 3 versions of it. Python 2 is almost uh, deprecated. It's not going to be supported anymore. So we completely stopped using Python in the industry. So even if you are familiar with Python 2, now is the time that we have to move towards Python 3. Uh, some syntactical changes would be there here and there between Python 2 and Python 3. But if you are starting to learn Python right now, always start with Python 3. Don't, don't look into Python 2. That's very age old one. Nobody is using it anymore. Now, if you download this exe file, and Python is platform agnostic. So, you have it on windows computer so this is a windows computer that i'm using uh, same thing will work very well on a mac or on a linux machine generally i prefer to have a linux machine but for all other convenience because most of you might be using a windows machine so that's why i'm trying to show all of this stuff on a windows machine so you can download the python exe file and you can install it. Wait a minute. Having said that, I'm not going to use this Python here. 
we are going to use a redistribution of it called as anaconda, the bigger brother of Python. Now, why anaconda? Why not Python? Anaconda also has the same Python behind the scenes. That's its engine. That's where the execution is going to happen. But to make it more user friendly, Anaconda comes up with a very good IDE. We call this as interactive development environment. So for different programming languages, you might have seen different um, interactive development environments. For example, Java, you have Eclipse, uh, you have Visual Studio, which can work with many different programming languages, be it C, C++, etc. So these IDEs make the interaction with the programming language and the development very easy. That's the reason I am choosing Anaconda. Second reason why we prefer to go with Anaconda rather than going with the uh, plain version of Python, Python comes up with a lot of modules, packages. We will see those packages, some of them in a little while. And there is a whole bunch of such packages. Now, if you are, uh, if you are, um, so, uh, if you are thinking, what is this module or what is this package? Uh, let me give you a simple layman example to understand the module or a package. In C C uh, I think most of you might might be familiar with C C That's why I'm quoting this example. Uh, whenever you are about to write your program, uh, at the beginning, the first line, we, we used to write hash include stdio.h, math.h, some, some things. Why are we writing those steps? So math.h, so math.h is nothing but a kind of package. It has a lot of functions pre-written into it. For example, if you want to use a sum function, sum function is maybe available already in math.h. You don't have to write the logic of how to sum numbers again. You can straight away use that function available in math.h, right? So that's a package. Package is a module is a set of functions which will make the job of a developer much more easy. And we have a whole bunch of packages. I don't, I don't know the count of them. It could be definitely going into a few thousands. Now, when you have such a whole bunch of packages, trying to figure out what packages you need and installing these packages one by one, is a is a very hefty task when you install your python for example if we go here and if we try to download this python 3.8 and when we install it it installs the very basic version of python it has a computation engine that's all but to get the capabilities of all the other built-in modules and third party modules, we have to install those modules one by one. I'll show you how to do that as well in a little while, okay? Now, Anaconda has brought in a package by combining all those modules that we commonly use as a data scientist. So that's why Anaconda is probably the most used tool for the data science teams across the industry, different companies, right? What they did is they packaged Python, they combined all the packages that typically data science data scientists use and created one single exe file. So you do not have to install a lot of these packages. These packages are pre-installed for us. So that makes our life much more easier. So two reasons why 
we choose anaconda one it brings in a beautiful ide and we will see how what that ide is in a little while two it also installs a lot of additional packages that we regularly use in the field of data science so we don't have to install them one by one uh, i see some of the people uh, um, raising their hand uh, unfortunately we cannot have a person to person interaction if you have any question, uh, please post a question on the chat window. I'll take a look at them and answer them for you. Thank you. Now, let's get started with this. So now when you click on get started, it gives you some product information, uh, some latest news about all of this, etc., cetera, et cetera. You, you can, look at the demo of anaconda you can read what is the latest in data science all these things what we are interested right now is installing anaconda individual edition so this individual edition is free of cost you don't have to pay any licensing fee even for the commercial usage so that's good python is also open source programming language and the repackaged version of it, the Anaconda, is also open source for us. Now, when you go here and click on the download button that you could see, it gives you the install, install files for different operating systems. So these are all the different operating systems. As I said, we have Python 2 and we have Python 3. These are the installation files of Python 2. Don't, don't even touch them. Don't install them anymore because the support has been taken out and the industry has been throwing this Python 2 away. So we do not want them. So these are the installation files that are built on Python 3 version. Now, depending on your system that you have, the, the laptop or the computer that you have, uh, you probably want to choose between a 64-bit installer or a 32-bit installer. Most of the computers today are already 64-bit. I don't see any 32-bits anymore available in the market. Now, if you are very sure that it's a 64-bit, go ahead and 60, by default go with 64-bit. If you are confident that it's not a 64-bit and it's a 32-bit, you can install it. No problem with um, 32 installation on a 64-bit system, but 64-bit installation on a 32 probably would throw some challenges. I don't know, it might, okay? Uh, if you are using a Mac, um, an Apple laptop, you can install, the, you can take the file from here. If you are using a Linux version of the machine, like Ubuntu or RHEL, whatever versions of uh, Linux. So you can take the installation file from here. Now, I'm going to click on this. And if we click on this, it would download this file. Uh, you can see here, it is going to download Anaconda 3 2020, some x86.64.exe. Uh, it's going, it will take some time. And to avoid that, I have already downloaded it and it's uh, ready in my download section. So see here, the file is uh, already ready, available with us. So let me go ahead and straight away install it. Installing is very simple. You just keep accepting the defaults and it would be done in a few, a few seconds. It doesn't take much time, right? Now, our installation is about to complete once we have this installation done we have python installed on our machine and on top of the python a anaconda a, a, uh, a ide provided by anaconda is also installed along with it all the required packages the modules that we use with the data science th those are also going to get installed okay and we can start using Python right away. 
if you look at some other tutorials, um, it might be slightly different. The reason is this is the new web page which has been recently launched by Anaconda. The older version was altogether different. So that's why you might see some sort of differences in the installation steps. And this is the latest one which we are picking from. Follow these steps, get the download, install it, and in a, few, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a minute or two, we would be ready to use this. So meanwhile, as it is trying to take uh, some time to install, let's briefly talk about uh, some of the concepts in Python. So Python is called as a interpreter. Generally, when you look at any Python tutorials, most of them use a kind of shell command line prompt to show their execution steps. And yes, that will also work. But uh, if you want to know more about Anaconda, you can fill up this form and you will get to see uh, some PDFs sent to your email which is very informative uh, for a beginner. Uh, if you are not familiar with Anaconda before, I would strongly recommend. Now, the installation part is done. And if you go here, Anaconda 364 bit is installed. And under this Anaconda 3, you see a lot of, lot of different applications. The one that you must be interested is this anaconda navigator here so click on this anaconda navigator it would throw up a kind of user interface in a minute yeah so this is the user interface that you typically see when you go to the Anaconda Navigator. I'm repeating this step. You go to Anaconda 3 here. Under this, you see a lot of different files. What you are interested in is this in this Anaconda Navigator. Now, you see a lot of them here. You see Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebook. You see PyCharm, Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebook, PyCharm, Spider. These four are the popular IDEs typically used by developers of Python. Some of them use PyCharm, some of them use Jupyter Notebooks, few of the people like Spider. Of all these four, the most user friendly one is the Jupyter Notebook. So whenever you are beginning to use Python for the first time, I strongly recommend you to start with Jupyter Notebooks. Then once you are comfortable, you can choose between a PyCharm or some other, some other user interface, some other ID. The most simplest of all of them is the Jupyter Notebook. So that's why I'm going to start with Jupyter Notebook. And Jupyter Notebooks are very popular in the, among data scientists. And most of them use this Jupyter Notebook. A Jupyter Notebook simply uses a, um, a browser. Uh, in this case, it is using a Internet Explorer to create a, um, inter, uh, to show you a uh, IDE, the development environment. These are all my directories available in the C drive. So you pick a project directory. You can pick any, any project directory. Let's say I pick my project directory as this PyCharm projects. And this is, these are the subdirectories that I have. AIML, DSML, Python. 
when you do this for the first time you might not have any of these on your machine so whatever the directories that are available on the machine you would only be able to see them now let's say i pick this one and in this one you could see some files already present like one underscore introduction to python dot ipy nb and two underscore introduction to pandas dot ipy nb some of the files and a additional file that you see here as titanic dot csv so this is the environment where you try to put all your files now how can we do it you can see a new button here click on this and what type of file you want to create do you want to create a folder do you want to create a text file do you want to create a python 3 file so let's say we click on the python 3 file so it has created a file and this file is currently not named so that's why you see untitled here so let's say we will change the name of the file let's say workshop underscore code you can give whatever the name that you want generally i would recommend not to use spaces in the names uh, you probably can use underscore instead of spaces so that's a programming standard that we typically follow okay so i gave a name to this a uh, workshop underscore code and let me explain all of these features over here once we once we created a workshop underscore code you can see a kind of um, box over here we call this as shell this is where we are going to write our programs let's say we write our sample program like this a is equal to 10 that's a line of code in python what this line of code does is create creates a variable called a and assigns a value 10 to it that's how simple python is and if you have seen that video that i have shared uh, introduction to python already you probably would not have any difficulty in understanding this step uh, in in that video um, i think pycharm was used but here we are going to use notebook so that's why my my objective here is not to go into the code right away to explain the features of um, notebook a notebook will always have an extension of ipy nb a typical python code will have an extension of dot py so a difference between a, a python code simple python code and a notebook is in this extension so notebooks will have an extension of ipy nb and python codes will have an extension of just py now let's say we want to add one more shell to it we would like to write the code in bits and pieces and we put those bits and pieces into smaller blocks let's say we write another line over here and c is equal to a plus p so this is a this is a block of code which is almost completed here now we would want to add more lines to this code so we would do that in the next shell so whenever you click on this plus sign here you would create a new shell and this is where we are going to type our code sometimes the good good thing about notebooks is a notebooks will have code and some description about the code you can call those as kind of comments output 
all of them in one single place. So that's the beauty about notebook. Now I'll complete this notebook. It's just like a, 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 a web page. Now, if I ship this notebook to anyone, I mean, if I send it as an attachment in the mail, if they open this in a Internet Explorer, something like this, they would be able to see my code, see the output that I have generated out of the code, everything without executing the code. Let's say now I am going to print the value of C here after performing those steps. I'm executing this. You can execute it by clicking the run button. This now this shell was highlighted. Now when you click on this run button, the code in this shell will be executed. This ones will be untouched. We can run this with the help of the run button over here. The keyboard shortcut is control enter. You can use control enter or you can use shift enter. One of these two control enter or shift enter. So when we highlight a shell and hit control enter, the code is executed. The block, whatever the code that is there in the block, it would get executed. Yeah. You, anyone post posting some questions? I see people uh, raising some of them. Oh, okay. I think I missed some of the questions. Uh, let um, let me answer them. Why Python 3.x is not supported to uh, uh, Anaconda? Maybe they haven't built the files. Um, they have to uh, look at the package module availabilities as well. Uh, very soon, they might launch the newer version of Anaconda with Python 3.8. As of now, it has 3.7. 3.7 is still the stable version. Yes, uh, 3.8 is still, uh, they, they call this as a beta release. Um, there might be some bugs and some improvements. Once it is thoroughly tested, and if they think that it's perfectly stable, Anaconda will pick it up and try to build their Anaconda distribution using Python 3.8. Okay. Oh, maybe Anaconda is waiting for Python 3.8 um, stability or some of the modules um, that An Anaconda is using were built for Python 3.7. Those modules are not yet available for Python 3.8. So if they have to release a version with Python 3.8, first those modules has to be rebuilt for Python 3.8 so that they can be packaged together. Okay. Now, you don't have to really worry about uh, those subtle differences in the versions 3.7, 3.8. I hardly see difference uh, working um, working on any project when we use 3.6 or 3.7. Uh, maybe those differences are not noticeable at all unless you go to the documentation and see uh, what is um, what is the difference between Python 3.6 and Python 3.7. You would probably not come across that. So I don't really. Uh, pay a lot of attention to those uh, minute differences of uh, the versions over there. As long as it does the job for us, we would keep sticking to Python, uh, let's say 3.6 itself. We have a production environment that we use in our office and we have 3.6 running on it for almost like uh, uh, more than a, uh, a six months by now. And we did not feel we did not see any need to update it to 3.7 or 3.8 for that matter. Why? It's unless you have a problem with a bug or unless you have some features that you want to use, which is available only in 3.7, there is no need to go ahead and update it. Uh, we can use um, Google Colab for sure. Yes. Um, 
to start with google collab is definitely a good good thing to start with the limitation is um, google collab gives you limited resources because it's just for practice it's uh, free of cost right so you get to have some limited resources uh, is my am i audible to all of you okay good fine okay yeah if you want to use uh, google collab yes you can try with google collab but if you have a system or you have a laptop or you have a desktop you could you could very much install all of this so that you get more uh, more uh, hands on on what modules are required you can install those modules and you can try to use the modules on on your own so coming back to the jupyter notebook intro so this is how we can add shells let's say now we want to add a new piece of code here that is p is equal to a 2.14 something now if we run this it gets executed so 2.14 is added to p if you do not want this block to be present uh, if you think this block is not useful you can just go ahead and delete it so when you cut it the block is automatically deleted unless you want to uh, you want to paste it further down it's just like assume that the block has is is kind of deleted okay then new is equal to 10.5 something you want to move this block of code up that means this one should be at the beginning so if you select the block and click this up arrow mark now this block has been moved up if you want to move it down by one step at a time you can click on the down arrow mark this button here is a stop button now sometimes when you write a block of code for example uh, think that you have built a function uh, you have written your own function and you execute the function it takes a lot of input data so the execution might take let's say 10 minutes now after few minutes you realize it that there is a problem in the function and there is no point executing that function anymore you want to stop the execution you can just go ahead and click on this stop button now this piece of code which was under execution would stop right away okay so that's a useful feature to interrupt the execution now this piece of code is under execution when you click the run now it just takes a blink of a eye to execute this block of code so that's why you probably would not see the difference when we go to some other examples later you would see the execution phase now if you want to interrupt the execution phase we can click on this so this is a kind of um, refresh button we if you want to restart the kernel sometimes we want to restart the kernel uh, different um, different situations where we want to restart the kernel we we want a package that is not installed along with anaconda now we go ahead and try to install that package now when we install that package we want to use the package but that package is not available right away because we installed it but this session of python has started before the installation of it now to make use of that package we have to restart this session of the python so we can go here and try to click on the restart button okay
yeah audio is working fine for most of them okay thank you finally you'll be able to hear good okay and if you want to run the entire kernel at one go completely rerunning it uh, let's say we built a uh, different blocks of code 10 15 of them we want to run all of them at one go you can click on this now let's say i want to give some instructions here so people who are reading this code later they understand what this code is going to do so this is a introduction to Jupyter notebooks python 3.7 is used now for today's class we are going to look at pandas and data visualization so this is something to tell what this particular code is doing in a lot of um, other programming languages we kind of give this instruction by commenting these lines out so if we put a hash symbol before the line then it becomes a comment so this is how we typically used to give um, instructions for people who are trying to read the this program to understand what this program does but a notebook has other features that we can use now this is actually not a code this is just a text part of it now we can go back here and change this to markdown now once you convert this block into a markdown it knows that this is not a piece of code to execute this is just a text input and it tries to show this in a in a in a markdown form think of this as a kind of a simple heading on a web browser and it clearly shows that okay this is a introduction to jupyter notebooks python 3 is used what is what is being programmed here we are going to see some uh, some programming on pandas and visualization right so in a notebook you have a kind of documentation present in it like this you have the piece of code and then you have the output when this piece of code is executed what is the output this piece of code has generated you can see it here itself so all of them in a simple web browser based ui your web browser can be a google chrome it can be a internet explorer or it can be a firefox doesn't really matter right so you get to see the a, the building of the code the comments and the documentation of it and the output of the code in one place and that's that's the reason i always prefer to go with jupyter notebooks rather than the other uis that we have seen here a lot of developers um, not may not be uh, data scientists uh, but developers of software other applications most of them like uh, pycharm a lot because pycharm is somewhat closer to visual studio that's why some of them like pycharm personally i am um, more interested in using jupyter notebook or jupyter lab they look similar but don't don't start with jupyter lab but stick to jupyter notebook and this is how a jupyter notebook would look like okay um, looks like the... let me take a pause any questions here so far clear with how we can use jupyter notebook good now talking about the modules 
in Python, we have a lot of modules. And if we have to use a module, we have to first import that module. For example, import pandas as pd. So pandas is the module name and pd is a alias that we are giving. So this is a very common step of importing modules. Now, how do I know what modules are there and what modules to use? So this comes with experience. That's where you would have to learn a lot of Python programming. To begin with, as a data scientist, the most important modules that you would probably have to learn is this. Make a note of this list. I would not be able to cover all of this for you, but you can prepare, you can read, up, read about these modules by looking at small tutorials by yourself. But in the field of data science, these are the important basic modules of Python. The first one is called NumPy, numerical Python. It has a lot of good functions, how to handle numerical data, everything built into it. So NumPy is the most uh, important package for us. Next is Pandas. In short, this is panel data. So it's simply called as pandas as a package name. So pandas will help you to manipulate and manage the data, like getting data from a flat file. We will see that in a while. Trying to look at how that data looks like creating new columns in it, deleting some of the existing columns. So that's called as data manipulation. Data manipulation and data analysis is mainly done through Pandas. So that's why Pandas is another very important library, uh, sorry, uh, module for the data science work. The third one is SciPy which is scientific Python. A lot of functions are already built into it. We may not use SciPy directly, but in future, we are going to use more advanced modules. For those modules behind the scenes, SciPy plays a significant role. So you don't have to go on and try learn SciPy, um, no, not required, but at least at a high level, what type of functions exist in SciPy is very, is good to know. And for data visualizations, we use matplotlib and seaborn. So these are the packages that we use. If we have to build any type of data visualizations and finally our secret weapon the magic wand in the hand of a data scientist we call it as scikit-learn uh, in short scalar right so these five modules of python are the most important ones for a data scientist and i'm not saying this these five are the only ones. It's not limited to these five, but these five are the most essential modules that we have to learn as a data scientist. Now, when we want to use pandas, so we have to first import it, import pandas as pd, uh, import numpy as np. So these PD and NP are the aliases. Now we can give any alias here. 
instead of PD, I can give PN, instead of uh, NP, I can give NM, but the standard used in the industry for pandas, it's PD, and for NumPy, it's NP. So we would always stick to the same standard. So anyone who is reading the code later doesn't have to get confused. Hey, what is PN? What is, where is this PN coming from? So the standard aliases exist for most of these uh, modules and packages, especially for these two, uh, import pandas as a PD and import NumPy, uh, uh, NumPy as uh, NP. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Let's see if we have any questions. Which one uh, you want me to repeat? Uh, seven here is the execution sequence. Okay. Now this is um, a, this is not a code. So this is a markdown. So I'm going to change this to markdown. So now it doesn't look like a code. It just looks like uh, a simple text over here. And anybody who reads this, who, who visits this um, IPy, uh, this um, IPy notebook, then they know that, okay, these are the packages that we are going to use in this particular uh, notebook. And this one here, let me execute it. So when it was under execution, for a brief while, you could have seen a star in this place. And after that, it changes to a number. Now that number is the sequence of execution. Now let me restart my kernel. Okay. Uh, one second. Now, this is the non code block, the markdown block. Let me execute this. You, you saw a star for a brief time period and then it changed to one. So, that one is the sequence of execution. Now, if we click on this, now this one is given two and if we click this this is given three now just in case at some point in time you execute this again it changes to four now you can notice okay this is one this is three this is four that means this block of code is executed after this block of code and if that's a problem for us we would probably have to go back and execute this entire code if you want that to be in sequential order. Okay, just a minute, sorry. Sorry for the interruption. So NumPy is actually a package. It's called numerical Python. It has a lot of built-in functions like how to handle um, numeric data and some sort of numerical manipulations are built into it. So NumPy is nothing but a simple package we are going to use as part of this code. In a little while you would see, but to use any of the functions that are available in NumPy, first we have to import that. And this is the packages that I was talking about. These packages are installed when we installed when we did installation of um, Anaconda, 
Now, there could be some of the packages which are not yet installed. Now, when we try to run them, for example, I, um, I run this step. When I run this, it throws an error. No module named text blob form. So text blob is another module, but we haven't installed it yet. So that is why it is throwing an error. Hey, you do not have a module called text blob installed on your Anaconda. Now, whatever the functions that are available in this text blob, I'll not be able to make use of it. Now we need to install it. Now to install it, you can go here and click on the Anaconda prompt, the shell. So there are two ways to install. You can say Conda install. Um, what is the name of the um, package? You can call it as text blog. Now it reaches a external repository. You need to have an active internet connection for this. So if you do not have an active internet connection, this will not work. Now from there, it will try to find out the package called the text blob and it will try to install if the package is found. It says the package is not found. So because it might not be available in the repository called Conda. So another popular repository to install packages along with Python is pip. So pip install t-a-x-t-b-l-o-b. -E now if pip has it, then it has successfully installed the text blob version is 0 0.15. So we have got this package installed. Now the package is just installed. I, 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 can, I can use it right now. Now if you say import text blob, there is no issue. But when we do not have the package installed, it was throwing the error. Okay. So these two packages, NumPy and Pandas, will help us in manipulating the data and that's the reason in this module in this session we are going to stick to mostly numpy and pandas only so when you are importing we are giving an alias to it the alias will make our further code easy let's say um, i probably want to add a new block of code here i would say some k is equal to np dot random dot r a n d of three now there should be some value in k now it says it created k k is an array and it has three values in it now how did we create this where did this output came from first we have used a function called random which is part of the pack module numpy np dot random so this is a function and this function is written in numpy so now you can simply write numpy dot random dot rand and create three elements using this function randomly create three elements using this function so that way we can do now this will also work but we have already given a alias to numpy as np. So you cannot use numpy anymore. So instead of numpy, we would always use np.random.rand. And these are the hierarchy. So random might have a lot of functions. And within that, rand is one function. And if you want to generate some numbers randomly, just to play with it. You don't have to explicitly try to find that. You can randomly create those numbers using these type of functions, right? Now, this is the module name. This is the submodule, and this is the function available in this module. So that's the hierarchy that you typically see in functions that are available in Python, okay? Huh. Let's see how we can start some simple programming. Uh, I think most of you might not have seen that video because all of this could have been much easier 
Uh, so let's start with it. Uh, I'll briefly spend some 10, 15 minutes on the Python programming, but then I want to jump into Pandas and spend more time over there. Um, fine. A variable in Python can be simply created like this. Now, if we say a is equal to 10, we have created a variable and it has a value of 10 in it. And if you want to print it, you can simply say print of a and it would print the value in it. Now, compare this with other programming languages. In other programming languages, if you have to define a variable, first you have to give what would be the data type of that variable. You have to explicitly say that integer a, float a, character a. So that's what that's how you try you, you typically try to create them. But in Python, Python is a very user friendly because you do not have to do all of these steps. Uh, Python mostly take care of these steps for you. Now, if you say type of A, look at when we simply say A is equal to 10, I did not explicitly say what should be uh, the value in it, what should be the data type of it. The moment it sees number without any decimal place, Python automatically creates this variable as an integer. Now, A is an integer. Uh, same, we are overriding A. A will be deleted and recreated in this step. Now, 10.5 and print A and print, sorry, print type of A. I want to print both of them, right? So A will be printed first. A is 10.5. And what is the type of A? Type of A now is float. In the first case, when we give A is equal to 10, a variable A is created as an integer. In the second case, when we give A, when we give a is equal to 10.5, it is created with a type of float. So that means Python is doing the job of figuring out what is the right data type for a given data and creating it appropriately. Now A is equal to, within quotes, data science. Now, the moment we give something in, in quotes, it would be treated as a string, as character data. Now, print A, and type of A. So it prints data science for you, and then it is in the form of a string. The type is a string here. Let's create one more. A is equal to capital T R U E. Now, print A. You can write print statement or you can simply put A and then you put type of A. Okay, uh, without, there will be always one explicit print if we don't write this. Now, it has a value of true and look at the data type of it. It is a Boolean. It's not a string anymore. So capital T-R-U-E will be treated as Boolean one and capital starting F with caps false will be treated as zero. So these are a couple of exceptions. So when you see something with capital T R U E, it means that we are actually creating a Boolean variable, which is like ones or zeros. Okay. The common data types that we typically see in any programming language. Integer, float, uh, string, and then Boolean value. Of course, we have complex numbers also, but in the world of data science, I, we don't worry about complex numbers. So we don't uh, get 
um, we don't see much of that. Maybe in some exercises you might come across, but uh, personally I haven't used complex numbers a lot, but they do exist. Uh, here, when we are adding a print statement to it, it is trying to create the output of this and try to show something like class load, but that's just because of the print statement there. Without a print statement, if you simply type type of A, it would be printed as a float. Like the class has nothing to do with uh, the typical class that you see in, uh, uh, in the um, uh, object-oriented program. Yes, we have object-oriented programming here also in Python, uh, but that would be a very, very far away step because if you are still at the beginning level, uh, we would probably Want, don't want to get into those concepts that is uh, advanced concepts of a programming language here. Okay. Uh, good. Now, there are other built in data types in Python which are very, very important. And unfortunately, I'll not be able to spend time on all of them. I'll probably spend I'm on a couple of them, um, you would have to read about them. So the most popular data types in Python, one is lists, then tuple, type, dictionary. So if we have to, effectively use Python programming, the power of Python programming comes in when you learn all these type of built-in data types available in Python, okay? So for example, how do you make a list of it? You can try to read about this on your own. Um, it's not good, it's actually in my phone. You can read about all of this on your own. Now, let's say we create a list. A list is generally created like this. 10, 20, 30, 40. So why these data types are very good? You probably don't need any, um, any data structure management uh, if you learn these data types. For example, in another programming language, if you have to store a set of values into one single variable A, you probably have to define A as an array and put elements into the array one by one. That's a bit, bit complex there. But here, just using a square brackets, and commas in between the data, I created A. Now, if we simply say A, it would print all the four values for you. We can access those elements, like how you access an array. A zero would print you the first element. Uh, A one will print you the second element. You can also use sequencing so when you see a colon operator in Python anywhere, treat the colon operator as a kind of sequencing. You do not have to write it explicitly. Now, if you use this sequencing one, two, three, it would print two elements for you. Element number one, element number one is 20, element number two, element number two is 30, and three won't be printed in Python, when you use sequence, the last one here is excluded. So it's virtually up to two, third element will not be printed. So when we wrote zero to three, first three elements will be printed, 10, 20, and 30. So this one is actually exclusion. So that's another exception that we have to remember. Now, the the built-in data types um, um, like list, et cetera, has a lot of um, modules available on it. Now, if we say a dot, now I 
this is a good part of uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Whenever we are trying to write code, we can get the help by using the tab button. Now, A is an object that I have created. And what is the type of A? You look at the type. Yeah, it should be a list. Yes, it is a list. Now, on this list, we can have some sort of functions applied on it. Now, what are the functions that are available? What are the modules that are available? So if you simply hit a tab, it gives you all the functions that are available for this particular uh, object list that we have created. Now, append is a function that is available. Now, let's say append uh, 50. Now, let's see what happens if we do this. After this step, if we say a, this function append, a dot append, has appended this element to a list with a. So that's how those those functions available functions on this list make our job easy if you are familiar with the data structures you probably would make you you probably would realize how easy it is to do all these functions or to all these operations with the help of built-in functions that are built-in mod modules that are already available on the list now, when we say a dot pop, now pop is a function which would take the last element. So, if it is like last in first out uh, it, um, in, in a data structure, you want to take the last element, you would simply say a dot pop. So, it would take the last element out. Now, if we if we try to uh, do a dot pop again so it would take the last element in the in the order so 40 will be removed and it would be thrown out right so this is how um inserting a element accessing uh, elements uh, adding elements deleting elements which will be very easy with this type of uh, data types that are available okay and that's why you have to read um, about this one so these are very very powerful ones so if you have to be strong in python programming the first things that you need to do is learn about these data types that are available in python what they are capable of where to use them so that's going to be a, a reading material for you so i have showed some simple examples of what a list can do you have to definitely uh, learn a lot of them so 31 is gone when for example right now if i try to run this again it was 32 but it is 35 now because this step is already executed in the sequence the next step execution is 35 so it has changed to 35 so that's why some of the numbers you might not see why i'm creating so many blocks of codes is to make it readable now each line and the output generated by the line is print next to it most of you you people are beginners to python um, now, when you look at each code of line, there is only one single sentence in each block and you know what that line of code does and what is the output that it has generated. So to make that more easier, I'm writing only one line of code in each of this. But generally, when we uh, start a project, we try to put five, six lines are a bunch of code that is performing a single task in one single block we will see that in a while okay to improve the readability i'm just trying to make it easier for people now when i send this um, uh, notebook to someone else 
they just look at each line of code and what is the what is the output that it has generated and it's easy for them to understand okay okay let's now jump into pandas our favorite now in pandas you have one okay uh, another another uh, another data types is uh, when we go to numpy in numpy we have a numpy array and we have uh, a numpy nd array so these are another data data types that is part of your numpy package the numpy arrays are very similar to arrays in any other programming language that you might have seen so this is a one dimensional array and nd array is a n dimensional array uh, maybe we would see uh, a couple of them in uh, in a short while but as part of numpy we can try to use them as arrays okay now let's see how do we create an array uh, I want to use some of the functions here. Now let's say a is equal to np dot random, which I have used. Dot uh, I'm going to use a random function to create a numpy array. So let's say I want to cre create a numpy array with four elements in it. Now, if we try to print the a, a is an array and it has four elements on it and these are the four elements one more one more trick one more user friendly trick when you want to know what a particular function is going to do generally if you haven't used this random dot rand function you would probably not realize what this function does and if you want to know you prop you go search on the internet or you go to the documentation of numpy searching for it but using the notebooks you can get help from the built-in documentation I'm sorry Um, so if you want to know what this particular function does on the keyboard you have to press shift and tab at the same time note it down so if you press shift and tab it will give you the inbuilt documentation and you can see the documentation here so expand it there is a plus sign you can expand it and you would be able to know what is the documentation trying to say and how to use it there would be a couple of examples also okay now this is always going to give you values between zero and one with a uniform distribution and that is why this function random will give you a values between zero and one you would never get one you would get zero between zero and one and depending upon the dimensions that you are asking for if you want four values it would give you four values if you want four rows and two columns now you are creating a two-dimensional numpy array so it would create a array with four rows so row one row two row three row four and two columns and column zero and column one in python indexing indexing means uh, the positions always starts from zero so this is position zero one two three this is position zero column zero and this is column one okay so that's how the numpy arrays are nd arrays work 
and now you can ask okay what is the advantage of going with numpy arrays the name itself says it's numerical python sometimes when we have to deal with matrices which which is definitely the case now a lot of those functions like how to do matrix addition how to do matrix multiplication i'm sure in another programming language we would have definitely struggled especially matrix multiplication is not so easy so as part of numpy we have a lot of built-in functions which could do matrix multiplication just like that and it's very fast as well so that is where we would probably use numpy arrays or numpy n-dimensional arrays rather than using lists or some other data types that we have seen so that's the advantage of going with the numpy arrays um, numpy arrays you do not have to jump into right away because numpy programming is a little um, little strong compared to pandas and other uh, i would request all of you to first get familiar with pandas once you are familiar with pandas then you probably go with numpy and in pandas we have again two data types are uh, the way how pandas tries to handle the data one is um, called as a series and two it is data frame uh, there was a question on when can we use uh, rdbms with this absolutely yes uh, we have to use a package uh, let's say I, I haven't installed that package, but I, uh, I'm, I'm just going to show you how to do it. Import CX Oracle. So this is a package as uh, some alias name. I can give this as CXO. Now this package CX Oracle has some built-in modules and built-in functions that can help us to make a connection with a oracle based database it can be oracle 11g or something right so that's how you can try to establish a connection with an external database from your python session but here today we are simply going to use flat files to get data into python rather than having a connection with an external database pretty much alone but i do not have a database uh, accessible from this to show you that connection so that's the reason i'm going to simply show you how to do it with the help of uh, files but here we have two more um, uh, data structures you can call them that is a panda series and a pandas data frame now this is where we would spend a lot of time and this is where we have to learn a lot now let's see how we can create a pandas um, pandas data frame so panda series is a one dimensional um, kind of equivalent to array in numpy and data frame is a two dimensional one so this is a, a equivalent of table in your rdbms okay and most of the time when we try to handle data our data would be in a two dimensional shape it would look like a table and that's the reason as part of your data analysis you could be data analyst you could be a data engineer or you could be a data scientist the most commonly used data structure that you would probably um, deal with is going to be a data frame that's the reason we have to spend a lot of time understanding data frame okay now how can we create a data frame so let's say I'm going to create a data frame. This is a name that I am giving to my data frame. Now, 
it can be any name i'm just giving my name as df you we have some valid naming conventions that we have to follow uh, generally it has to start with an alphabet no numbers and it can be followed up by numbers alphabets and special characters like underscore we don't use underscores at the beginning or underscores at the end because underscore at the beginning and underscore at the end are typically some used with some system methods that are already built into python so we do not want confuse we do not want to confuse the developers between a system built one versus a user built one so we always starts with an alphabet we can use underscore like this in between but not at the beginning not at the end uh, this is also a valid name you can say underscore df so this is also a valid name in python but as a programming standard we would always try to avoid it so that we don't confuse people like whether it is a created one by the developer or it is a built-in one okay pd dot now what are the functions that are available let's say data It may not execute this step. Why? A. Now we have created a data frame from A. And let's look at how data frame A would look like. So this is a data frame. Um, the difference between a NumPy array is, it is just arranged in the form of um, a nested list. So think of this as a list, this as a list, this as another list. But when it comes to data frame, it has a proper structure so these are rows for us and these are columns for us and because we did not give any column names we don't have column names and these are column indexes and the column indexes starts with uh, zero and one we can give column names we can give column names like df dot okay df underscore one dot columns is equal to uh, let's say i will call this as column one and column two so these are the names that i am giving as column names for this df1 now if you try to print df1 um, underscore one then it would be having new names so column one and column two this is like when we created it we don't have column names but when we give these column names explicitly the column names are created df underscore two is equal to df underscore one and in that i'm going to select only column one now this is called as slicing we would spend a lot of time on slicing but if you want to select only one column out of a data frame so treat this as a table and you want to select only the column one out of this table so you can simply say df1 and within this um, you can within the quotes you give the name of this now df2 will be created 
Now, what is df underscore two? df underscore two will have only one column, and that is this column. And what would be the data type of it? So, type of df underscore two. It's a series. When it is one dimensional, pandas treats them as series. When it is two dimensional, when you have more than one column in it, it would be treated as a data frame. So in pandas, we have two structures. One is the series, one dimensional one, and the other one is data frame, the two dimensional one. We don't generally create data frames like this. Why would we create data? We are going to analyze the data. When we want to analyze the data, the data has to come from some external place. Slicing horizontally, uh, we would do in a while. Okay. In NumPy, we, we cannot give column names. It just exists as a n-dimensional array. So this is how it would look like. But when we are doing data analysis, we want to have column names. Think of a table without column names. How could you handle it, right? So NumPy arrays are meant for a different purpose. That's exactly the example that I gave. If you have a matrix, matrix doesn't have column names. There are two matrices and you want to multiply them quickly that can be easily done with numpy but if you want to have a table with columns column names so that you understand what each column is what each column does you need to have a structure which is very similar to a database table and that's where uh, we get to the pandas data frame now I'm going to import some data into my Python from an external file. So you look at the file here. I have a file called titanic.csv. I can upload a few more files to it. Uh, let's say I have one more file called mpg. Upload this. I want to upload one more file, an empty cars. Upload this. Now I have three files here. These are CSV files. Now, what are CSV files? If you want to take a look at one of the CSV files, I can show that. CSV stands for comma separated version file. So this is how the file looks like. Uh, CSV files are also called as the flat files. In a flat file, generally the data will be separated using commas. So see here, you have a comma between each of the data elements. So comma separated version file means the data is separated using a comma. And the first line here has column names like manufacturer, model, displacement, year, cylinder, transmission type, right? This looks very similar to a um, automobile data and this is an automobile data so these are the column names and this is the data from second row the data starts so now we want to read this data into python and create a data frame out of it let's see how we can do that my df i am naming it as my df we can give whatever the name that you want to Yes, though I am using a comma separated version file, you can read the data with the file with extension .txt, .tsv, tab separated version file. Uh, in comma separated version file, the delimiter, the data is by default separated by a comma. In a tab separated file, it would always be a tab. In some other file, somebody might have created a different delimiter. So when you look at the file, you would come to know what is the separator. If comma is a separator, we would read the data um, by using comma as a delimiter. If in place of comma, if you have a tab, then we could read the data as using tab as a separator. 
pd dot read underscore csv though the name says read underscore csv using this function we can write read the data from any type of flat file now again i don't know what read underscore csv function does i want to take the help of jupyter notebook when you hit shift under shift and tab at the same time it is going to throw you the help what are the arguments that this function read underscore csv is going to take the file path where is the file the file is in this working directory so i can simply say uh, what is the name of the file i want to read this file titanic.csv so the name of the file is titanic.csv comma again shift tab what is the separator data separator data separator is by default comma and in our data it is a comma so we don't have to explicitly say that header do we have header in the first row i am not sure so let's look at the uh, yes header is nothing but first row has column names so we have header so we need to leave it also if we have uh, if we don't have header then we could change the argument as header is equal to false now we have header so we would leave all of this now just other arguments are self intuitive when you try to read about it now we have created a data frame called my df by reading the file from an uh, external file by reading the data from an external file now let's see what we have in my df my df dot shaped so this is a function which will tell you how many rows are there and how many columns are there in my data frame printing data frames is not advisable why sometimes your data files might have thousands of rows or even lakhs of rows so trying to print them doesn't make any sense so first you need to look at the size of your data frame to know the size of your data frame you simply say my df dot shape so it will print you the number of rows and the number of columns it has if you want to have a brief look at the data how does the data look like now you can say my df dot head a function which will print few records first few records if you want to print a specific set of records i want to print first two records so it has printed the first two records now look at this is the index row index row index starts from 0 1 so on so don't worry about this these are the columns that we have passenger id so this data set is about the titanic disaster uh, the information of the passengers who were there on the ship on the ill-fated night uh, let's try to understand what happened uh, who are the people how many of them perished in that accident and who are they etc right some sort of data analysis to understand this data we will read one more file we can do a lot of data analysis and we can understand the data by doing some data analysis on top of it survive now this is a column which takes values like 0 and 1 if the if the if the survived column says 1 that means that passenger has survived if the survived column says 0 the passenger is not survived passenger class what class they have traveled first class second class third class name of the passenger gender of the passenger age so some some information that we have about the passengers over there fine good so these are this is the data that we have we have 891 rows 12 columns and this is the data about uh, the titanic now let's read one more file my df2 is equal to pd dot read underscore csv and in this I am going to read the file mpg.csv. Now, because this file mpg.csv 
is present in the same directory mpg.csv capital python is case sensitive anywhere capital letters and small letters would be treated differently so you have to exactly write it in the proper case okay so mpg.csv and we would read this we created one more data frame and by default header is equal to true because i know that we have column names there and data separator is a comma because this is a csv file so we uh, we have the comma um, uh, as it is okay now let's see how many records we have in my df2 my df2 dot ship so it has 234 records and 11 columns let's see uh, some data df2 dot uh, um, head let's print a couple of records so this is the index zero row, first row these are the columns manufacturer model displacement here number of cylinders etc so this is a data that is about car so we know okay fine so we got the data into uh, into python now starts the um, data management now i want to slice i want to slice few rows for example let's say my df3 sorry my df3 is equal to r i'll call this as mpg2 is equal to my df2 so you have seen how we have sliced the list by using the indexes we can do the same over here but a data frame is two dimensional so we have to explicitly say what we are slicing are we slicing the rows are we slicing the columns before the comma it is slicing the rows after the comma it means it's slicing the uh, columns now let's say we give 0 to 10 and nothing after the comma and let's see what we what output that we we get my df2 okay now this is not allowed it has to be so using this i location so i location will help you to slice the data frame by looking at the positions now what is the output of this mpg2 dot shape look how many rows we got we got 10 rows why we are slicing the first 10 rows so that's why we got the first 10 rows in the output and we did not mention anything about the columns so by default all the columns we got in the output now mpg3 is equal to my df2 dot i lock let's say we want to select first 25 rows and column number two to column number six now let's look at what mpg3 has mpg3 dot shape now it has got four columns and the first 25 rows so the first 25 rows is there and then we have got only the four columns column number two three four five column number six is not selected let's see what are the columns we have uh, my df2 dot columns so this will print the columns that are available in a given data frame so the columns are manufacturer index 0 index 1 index 2 index 3 index 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 that's how our columns are now let me print the columns that we have got in mpg3 dot columns 
what we got column number with index 2 with index 3 with index 4 and with index 5 no six, uh, 6 is not included though we give 2 to 6 always remember python the last one is excluded okay so this is slicing based on the column positions or the row positions we can do slicing based on um based on names also now how can we do based on names so mpg4 is equal to my df2 and then we want to select the columns with the name here and cyl comma uh, plus okay, these are the columns that we want to select now let's look at what we have on mpg4 dot uh, so we got a data frame with all the rows but we are printing only five of them here and what we have selected is column year cylinder and class okay so this is how we can select rows select columns select columns using their indexes select columns using their names column names okay fine uh, any questions so far good if we want to create a new column let's say we want to create a new column on mpg4 the column doesn't exist so i am going to call it as new column is equal to we can do this in many ways you can apply some mathematical operations say for example mpg4 and we have a column called uh, year in it and let's say we have uh, another column called cylinder uh, here uh, adding them doesn't make any sense at all i do not want to do but just in case if we have to do that mpg4 it encodes c by l so this is an arithmetic operation so using an arithmetic operation we are creating a new column adding these two columns will result into this creation of a new column it doesn't make sense uh, to do it this way that's okay now if you look at the mpg4 mpg4 it has a new column which is created by adding um, the year with the another value called cylinder over here so it created a new column logically it doesn't make any sense but just for the sake of showing how to do it we did this uh, i do not want this column I, I i want to drop it so we can simply say mpg4 dot drop and what column that we want to drop we want to drop the column which is a, a new column and uh, we have to mention something called access is equal to one because okay mpg drop this column and recreate mpg4 so right now mpg4 has um, four columns they are year cylinder class and new column new column i just created for the sake of showing it it doesn't make any sense to have this so i'm going to drop this so i'm going to drop this new column by saying mpg4 dot drop access is equal to one uh, this access is equal to one will tell are we deleting a row are we deleting a column if we give access is equal to zero that means we are trying to delete a row it doesn't make sense why new column is a column not a row so we should give access is equal to one maybe in some case when you want to delete a row you can give the row number 
and give axis is equal to zero over there okay so this is how we can delete a column from a existing data frame now you may think you may be thinking like why do we need to do all of this because there are databases and sql can do all of this stuff yes i completely agree but there are a lot more advantages of dealing with a data frame now let's say i have something like mp no uh, my df2 dot describe just one single function and it has generated some output and this output is very very important to understand the data now on this my df2 uh, we have columns like uh, displacement air cylinders city highway these are numerical columns of course there are other columns like class etc which are string columns on the numerical column this function describe has computed these statistics so these these things that you see here are all statistics the mean value for displacement standard deviation minimum 25th percentile 50th percentile 75th percentile max all of them computed with one single step probably if you have to do this in other programming languages you would have to write a whole bunch of code one by one on each of these columns so that's how pandas data frames makes data analysis more simpler now the first step is to understand any data is by looking at the descriptive statistics this is called as descriptive statistics the mean 50th percentile minimum max and standard deviation so to understand data yes we need to have some very basic concepts of statistics at least to know what is what is mean what is standard deviation what is median 50th percentile etc but yeah that's where we will probably have to spend a lot more time to learn about data analysis um you mean i'm not sure um out with square brackets may create some sometimes disturbances to look back can we delete them when not wished uh, i'm not sure which line you are talking about uh, but uh, if you can be specific uh, ma'am i can i can delete, i can delete that okay now Oh, you mean the output shell? Yeah, we can delete the output shell if you want to. After building the code, you can go to kernel, restart and clear output, and your code will be there intact as it is. But all the output would be cleared from the from the prints uh, below those uh, those lines. Okay, fine. Now we have to jump into the data analysis um, there is a lot more things in pandas uh, you have to you you have to learn but let's right now jump into the data analysis for example we have my df2 and i want to know how many um, different types of cars are there so i want to know what are the different classes of cars so to start with my data analysis i first want to take a look at the variable class it is a character data so i want to summarize this remember in this data we have 234 cars out of the 234 cars we have 62 of them are suv types 47 of them are compact mid size 41 subcompact 35 so this total sum 
boils down to 234. Okay, now I know. In my data, I have a lot of cars which are SUV types, and I have very few cars which are of two seater types. So this is the distribution. So this is how you start to analyze the data. For country for numeric data, you look at the summary statistics. Look at the city mileage. So CTY stands for city mileage. The minimum mileage of a car starts at nine and the maximum mileage goes all the way up to 35. And by the way, the units are miles per gallon. In India, we measure it in kilometers per liter, but here the units are very different. A gallon is 3.5 liters and a mile is 1.6 kilometers. So the car's mileage minimum starts with, the car with minimum mileage starts with nine miles per gallon and the maximum car, the car with the maximum mileage is at 35. The mean, most of the cars, the midpoint of the mileage is somewhere around 16. The median, 50th percentile, is somewhat around 17. So in the city, this is how the mileages look like. And in the highway, minimum mileage starts with 12 and the maximum goes up to 44. Mean is roughly around 23 and median is roughly around 24. Okay, it looks like uh, the cars give slightly higher mileage in highway than city by just looking at these two. Now, you probably don't have to do analysis to know that because we know about cars. Imagine if you are trying to deal with some healthcare data and you see some columns like BMI, blood pressure, etc. You are not a doctor to understand this. So looking at this data will help you to realize how is the data and how does it uh, look like, okay? And that's how you have to start your data analysis. Unfortunately, we are already at the top of the hour. Uh, I, I took a little more time uh, because we spent some time in the introduction to Python because I felt a lot of people haven't really um, gone through the basics of Python. So that's where we probably lost somewhere around 10 to 10 minutes. Um, tomorrow, we would start with the data visualization. We would have spent some time in today, but unfortunately we couldn't. We would start with the data visualization. And uh, after that, we would jump on to uh, the first algorithm, which is the linear regression. Uh, it's going to be very, very exciting tomorrow to trying to learn your first algorithm. And um, I'm, 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 I'm really excited to share how a typical algorithm work like. But again, my request, uh, please try to go through some of these basics of pandas, and uh, data analysis tomorrow i would directly jump into the data visualization if you understand those concepts clearly then it makes my life easier to show you a uh, couple of algorithms and how the algorithms will work okay in that's the that's that's what exactly i told you about this particular statement here you can pretty much compute all of this using SQL and imagine the amount of lines of code that you have to write to generate the same output in your SQL for mean separately, standard deviation separately, minimum separately, 25th, 50th, 70th max and do it for each variable then you kind of repeat this procedure or create a stored procedure. That's a huge lines of code and effort from the developer. Here, a simple described statement and then done. Not, we are not going to stop here. We're going to see a lot more things, right? Um, there is a lot more uh, statistical computation that we are going to do, which is much easier when you are using uh, data analytics tools like Python, R, etc compared to the traditional data processing uh, ones uh, like SQL. Yeah, you get a good advantage of simplicity when we do it in Python and R. 
Okay, I hope I answered most of the questions that came in during the session. We can do statistical computations on numerical columns, on categorical columns, on uh, columns which has character data. We can do sum, uh, sorry, counts. It's called the data aggregation. Okay, uh, so this is a character column and the data aggregation is counts. These are numeric columns and the data aggregation is through statistics. That's how you try to differentiate between them. I hope this session helped you to get started with Python and by no means this is uh, Python. You probably haven't seen even a minuscule one one percentage of what Python is and what Python is capable of. My objective of this session is to get help, uh, get help in starting by doing the installation of Jupyter, how to use the Jupyter, how to write simple codes in Python. It's going to be a long, long journey for you to get started and get comfortable using all of this in Python on your own. It definitely takes a lot of a uh, lot of time and effort from you, but believe me, if you put that effort, it is going to be very fruitful. You would get a huge, huge advantage by learning learning Python. Tomorrow we will start with data visualizations and some data processing, like handling null values, etc. Yes, we will do that. We will do that anyway when we go to the algorithm. 